A big thanks to Wondrium for sponsoring this video. I'll show you a magic trick I learned on there later. Hey everyone, Path here, and in this video I want to talk about some problems in quantum mechanics that would have been impossible to figure out, but this thing called perturbation theory came to save the day. We'll also understand what it actually means for a problem to be difficult to solve, hopefully. So if you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. So first things first, let's start by understanding that any quantum system that we want to study can be described by a wave function. For our purposes, this wave function is just a mathematical function that contains all the information about our system. Say our system is a single electron, for example, then the wave function can tell us the probability that we will find this electron in different locations or different positions in space. I've discussed this in more detail in other videos before, so check out my quantum mechanics playlist if you're interested. Now, here's an important question. How do we know what the allowed wave functions for any system look like? How do we take a system we're studying and find its wave functions? Well, we do this by using the Schrodinger equation. This is one of the most important equations in quantum mechanics, and we can take properties of our system, like the kinetic energy of the particle in this case, as well as any potential that it happens to be in, we can plug this information into the Schrodinger equation, and then we can solve it to find what the allowed wave functions are. Simple enough, right? Well, in many cases, yes, this is simple enough. But for certain systems, this is difficult. Why? because even though we can plug in the information about a particular system, that doesn't necessarily mean we know how to solve the Schrodinger equation for that system in order to find out the allowed wave functions. After all, depending on what the system is like, the equation can become very complicated very quickly, and we might end up with a differential equation that we have, so far, no techniques to solve. So what can we do in this case? Do we just resign ourselves to the idea that we'll never know what the wave functions of this kind of system would look like? Well, of course not. Luckily, there are a few clever techniques we can use to work out an approximation of the wave functions of the system, even if we can't calculate it exactly, and even if we don't have a computer with us. One way to do this is by using perturbation theory. The idea is to take a system that we do know how to solve or in other words, we can find its wave function, and then slowly perturb or modify it to match the one we're trying to solve for. And interestingly, we can approximate the allowed wave functions in terms of the allowed wave functions of the original system that we did know how to solve. Importantly though, perturbation theory works best when we have a system that is close to the original one and it can be thought of as the original system plus some small change. The smaller, the better. To understand all of this, let's first remember how energy levels and wave functions work for quantum systems. Let's say our quantum system consists of a particle in a potential well. Basically, this means that it would take some amount of energy for the particle to enter this region of space, whereas the central region is lower in energy so our particle can easily access it and is most likely found here. Of course, in quantum mechanics things are a bit more complicated, so if you want to find out more about systems like this and want a little bit more detail on this idea, then check out this video up here. But anyway, this particle in this system is only allowed to have specific amounts of energy. This idea is known as quantization, and it's an interesting feature of quantum mechanics. Let's say, for example, that this is the lowest allowed energy level, then this is the next one, and then this one, and so on. Corresponding to each of these energy levels is a wave function. For a particle like this, the wave function tells us where in space we are most likely to find our particle. For the lowest energy level, the wave function might look like this, meaning the particle is most likely to be found in the middle of the potential well. For the next energy level up, the wave function might look like this, meaning the particle is most likely to be found here or here, but absolutely will not be found at the very center of the well. For more information on this idea, check out this video up here if you're interested. So why are we looking at these energy levels and wave functions? Well, we can use these to approximate the wave functions and energy levels for another similar system, but this other system is one that we don't yet know how to solve with our mathematical skills. For example, let's imagine we introduce a little bump here in the middle. 
where the potential slightly increases. One way to do this would be to place a small charged particle in the middle, meaning it would repel like charges, thus increasing the potential. The exact details don't really matter here. The important thing is that this system is different to the one we saw earlier, which was a flat-bottomed potential well. This means all the information we plug into the Schrodinger equation about the system is very slightly different compared to before. And it's possible we don't know how to solve this version of the equation now. Luckily, however, because the new system's perturbation is small, the energy levels and the wave functions end up shifting only very slightly compared to the first system. Notice that the new energy levels and wave functions I'm drawing here are what we are actually trying to calculate. But for the sake of this video, I'm just showing something that looks relatively similar and the energies haven't shifted that much. By the way, mathematically, we can also write the new system's Hamiltonian, the part of the Schrodinger equation where we put in stuff about our system, as the old system's Hamiltonian plus the small change. We also end up using a term that consists of the old Hamiltonian plus this small change multiplied by a new parameter that basically takes values between 0 and 1 and allows us to simulate the switching on of the perturbation as we go from 0 to 1. In practice though, this lambda just helps us in the long mathematical steps we have to take to apply perturbation theory. But before we continue, I'd like to show you a quick card handling magic trick that I learned over on Wondrium, the sponsor of this video. So here I've got a complete deck of cards, and I'm going to try to move the top card, in this case the Ace of Spades, to some random position in the deck. We can use a random number generator to give us the position it needs to be moved to. This can be done using five perfect shuffles, that is, interlacing every other card from the top half of the deck with the bottom half. Here's how all of this works with a smaller, simpler number. If we wanted to move our card to the seventh position, then it needs to have six cards above it. We can then write that number, six, in binary, which then becomes one, one, zero. For each one, we perform an in perfect shuffle, and for each zero, we perform an out perfect shuffle. Now, since we wanted our card, the Ace of Spades, to be in the 23rd position, we had to do this with five perfect shuffles. So let's start counting. And hopefully this is going to be our 23rd card, the Ace of Spades. I learned the mathematics behind this trick in a course on simple mathematical magic tricks by the brilliant Arthur Benjamin. And then I applied it to a relatively tricky sleight of hand move which is the perfect shuffle or pharaoh shuffle. Anyway, let's talk about Wondrium. Wondrium is the premier entertaining and educational video subscription service with a carefully curated collection of short and long form videos, tutorials, how to's, travelogues, and documentaries. It's like a museum for your mind. I personally love it because I can develop and further many of my own passions from science and mathematics to music to learning a new language. I've already watched a handful of videos and courses, each of which discussed ideas in a super engaging and easy to understand way, and I can't wait to dive into more. Now, if you'd like to check out all the wonderful things that Wondrium has to offer, then head over to wondrium.com forward slash path G, which is also the top link in the description box below, so you can just click that to start your free trial today. Once again, that's wondrium.com forward slash path G. A huge thanks to Wondrium for sponsoring this video, and I hope you enjoyed my sort of magic trick. Now, when the perturbation is small, we can actually use lambda to say that the new system's wave functions are equal to the original system's wave functions, plus some terms that show us how much they've been tweaked. Like, the new ground state wave function is equal to the original ground state one, plus some small tweak that is of the order lambda, plus some even smaller tweak that is of the order lambda squared, and so on and so forth. This is an infinite series. And each term here has a specific technical definition, but let's hold on to that thought for a second. A very similar idea is true for the energy levels of the new system. The new ground state, for example, is equal to the old ground state, plus a small term of the order of lambda, plus an even smaller term of the order lambda squared, and so on and so forth. If we were to calculate all of this, we would get the exact value for the new energy level, but we can't calculate infinitely many terms. Thankfully, however, the first order change is the biggest, so we can calculate that 
and this gives a good approximation in most cases. After some complicated mathematics, we find that the first order change is simply a function of the perturbation, the little bit that we added to our original Hamiltonian, which is the change in the new system, and it's also a function of the corresponding wave function of our original system. This sounds complicated, but an example should help clarify. If we're looking at the ground state of our new system, the first order correction or change to the energy value of the energy level only depends on the perturbation, the thing that we've added, and on the original ground state wave function. That's it. No complicated differential equation that's impossible to solve or anything like that. We just need to know this and this and we can calculate our first order change. So we can say that our approximation for the new energy levels is given by the original energy levels plus the first order correction which is relatively easy to calculate in many cases. And we can do a similar thing for the actual wave functions of the new system. These are a tiny bit more complicated, but again, stuff that we can calculate as opposed to solving an impossible, supposedly, differential equation. If we wanted an even more accurate approximation, we could look into second order corrections too, but again, these are a little bit trickier and a little bit smaller, so they don't matter quite as much. In most cases, the first order approximation is more than good enough. Interestingly, this term here in quantum mechanics is known as the expectation value of what is known as the perturbation operator, the little thing that we added on, when the system is in the original energy states. I'd love to make a video explaining this idea in a bit more detail, so let me know if you'd like to see it. Also, if there's anything we've discussed here that is unclear, then please do let me know in the comments down below. I realize these are some tricky ideas that I might have glossed over bits of, so like I said, tell me down below. Anyway, this video is long enough, so I'm going to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Please check out my merch linked in the description. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Einstein. And finally, I want to say a big thank you to my Giga patrons and to all of my other patrons as well over on Patreon. That's also linked down below if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you very soon.